today we'll start with DNA viruses. So I'm going to present a case as well in the beginning. I just want you to pay attention. And I'll also post it after the lecture. Okay, let's begin. Uh, I think many of you may be familiar with this person. I, I, I do have some of the videos. I'll see if I could play it after the lecture, at the end of the lecture. And you can see a person known by a tree man. Alright, let's begin with the case first. Uh, again, uh, human papilloma virus is also included in sexual transmissible diseases. Remember I said there are some of the bacteria are viruses and DNA virus, especially human papilloma virus, very important. And that's again a typical case study. We have a person, 34-year-old 30, woman, wants to get checked out because uh, her partner, her sex partner, has small solid bumps on the skin on the shaft of the penis. You can see over here uh, a typical uh, genital wart. It's called typical genital wart, and in this case, as far as her history is concerned, you can see that uh, he was diagnosed and treated for genital warts about a year ago. And his healthcare provider told him that they could recur. So there are many things important for this virus. This once you have it, you have it for the rest of your life. There are many uh, important things that you want to. Uh, know about this virus. In this case, uh, this person had no history of abnormal pap smear and no history of STDs. Remember, we did talk about if you have one STD, the chances are that you may have other STDs as well. And pap smear is very important in this case because human papilloma viruses are known to cause cancer. This is a pre cancerous condition especially cervical cancer. We'll come back to answers that question, answers afterwards. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, uh, last past me was performed four months ago. Sexually active <coughs> I was trying to download the real player. Let's see. Is it possible? Okay. Get back to it afterwards. All right. Now, uh, sexually active. There's another important thing for sexual transmissible diseases that it actually happens via uh, sexual transmission and uh, you can see from here sexually active with, with men only since age 16 and has had a total of seven sex partners over her lifetime. There was another issue for many a sexual transmissible diseases that you are likely to have that if you have more than one sexual partner. Currently sexually active with one partner for the last eight months. Uh, she uses oral contraceptives for birth control. And it's, it's also important for us to know, because remember, can you see any significance of her using oral contraceptive in terms of uh, having worried about sexual transmissible diseases? No physical barrier. So the chances are that she can still get all these viruses and bacteria uh, via sexual contact. Okay, now the question that we're going to ask ourselves that as for previous STDs as well, uh, what should be included in her evaluation? That's another common thing that when we come across these patients, what do we do? The other things are her vital signs, you can see pretty much normal over here. She's cooperative, she's giving good history, sometimes people hide. And uh, her other exams are the normal limits, pelvic exam is normal. So pelvic exam is normal. Visual inspection of genitalia reveals multiple small, less than 0.5 centimeters flesh, colored, 
capillar regions in the perineal area. In the perineal area, she does have some of these conditions. Now, the question we have to ask her, ask ourselves, is what is the differential diagnosis for a papular genital lesion? Remember, we talked about ulcers on genitalia. In this case, this is a papular, like a growth that pops out. We call a uh, bump. And uh, what's the most likely diagnosis based on the history and what lab test should we send for? And finally, uh, what is the effect of treatment on future transmission? Because many a time people are going to ask you, is this transmissible or not? Am I cured or not? What is the possibility of recurrence even after treatment? And uh, of course, remember we talked about counseling, very important in these cases. And uh, is there any risk factor involved and do we really need to treat her partner or not? So we're going to begin with genital human papilloma, papilloma virus called HPV. Very important DNA virus. Now, as far as the STDs are concerned, this happens to be one of the most common virus. One of the most common virus to such an extent that even if I was to say, uh, for argument's sake, each one of us is infected with that, it may be true. If not, by the age 50, the statistics are 90% of the population is already having this virus. So you can see the probability, you can see the problems that you're going to come across, and really have to be very careful. Now, now there are more than 30 types which can infect genital tract. That's another challenge that we have. If you find a treatment for, for one, a vaccine for one, still you have chances to be infected and reinfected again and again. Now, we normally divide them into two groups. And why do we divide them into two groups? Because the most important thing we care for these kind of papilloma viruses is that they lead to cancer. And they lead to one of the commonest cancer in US and in the in rest of the Western world is cervical cancer. So very high incidence and uh, between this virus and cervical cancer. So it also will come to you that women are more prone to these viruses and they carry these viruses and that actually may become malignant. And uh, nevertheless, most genital infections are transient. So many times they come and go, we don't even notice it. They are asymptomatic, so we may have it without having any symptom, and may not apparently have any clinical consequence. Now as far as the incidence is concerned, you can see uh, annual incidence of sexually transmitted FA is 6.2 million per year. You can imagine 6.2 million and the, the cost that cost to the uh, health industry is about 1.6 billion. You can imagine how much toll does it have on the health industry. And finally you can see uh, there are about 20 million people currently have a detectable genital HPV infection. So that's what is detectable. And remember detectable means that they came with a symptom or we in investigated that. As far as uh, prevalence is concerned, as I said earlier, it is estimated that 50% of sexually active men and women acquire HPV at some point in their lives. The only way that they are unable to acquire or they are prone from acquiring or immune from acquiring is that they don't have sexual activity at all. But the recent estimate is about 80% especially women, will acquire genital HPV by the age 50. So that's another something to do with women only, but I, as I said earlier as well, the chances are men will also acquire, but many a times it's reported more in women. The reason is that uh, we do pap smear, and we really are more interested in finding out are they prone to cervical cancer or not. So it's a very common test done. Now, the incidence and prevalence of HPV is usually associated with the disease. Many times, if the person is asymptomatic, obviously 
he or she will never report to a physician or we will not really have any clue as to what's going to happen. But in this case, you can see the commonest presentation is genital warts. That's the commonest presentation that we usually have. And the incidence is pretty much very high, you can see. An estimated 1.4 million are affected at any given time. 1.4 million. And then again, cervical cancer uh, is very important because this is something which is related to this particular virus. And we would not cover cervical cancer in this lecture, but just want you to keep in mind that some of the viruses are a leading cause of causing cancer, and papilloma virus is one of them. Now, if you see the incidence over here, I know it's very clear at the back, that you can see that uh, it's between uh, incident in most death rate with cervical cancer in by race. It's obviously is decreasing over time because of the better diagnosis and uh, better health awareness in women and more and more uh, health uh, HMOs are covering this test. But nevertheless, you can see that uh, the cancer by the year, it's like 1973 approximately to, 19, to 2001. It's pretty much high uh, in both population, but in black population it's at least twice the number as compared to white population and it's also associated with a very uh, high mortality as well and obviously more in this group as compared to this. And that's because of health disparity, not having proper HMO care and so on and so forth. Now, what we need to know is that transmission, that can this virus be transmitted? That's the most important thing that you need to ask yourself that uh, would I get it, am I prone to it, how is it transmitted. And remember for bacterial and viruses we really want to make sure that we have a solid data on that. In this case obviously this is an STD, so predominant associated with sexual activity, that's for sure. It does have vertical transmission but that's more or less uh, is possible, but many a times because of good antenatal care uh, we usually, uh, you know, take care of that in advance, so the chances are less that it's going to be transmitted. But of course, uh, uh, is, there is a possibility. And then again, it can occur, there's another problem with this, is that it doesn't mean that you have to have a wart, or you have to have a lesion to transmit it. There's something, if you go back to the basic chapter of virology that we covered in general uh, microbiology, there is something called viral shedding, where people shed off viruses. This is among those viruses that people will shed off. So it's going to be there in almost all the secretions that come out of uh, the infected person. And then it's going to go and uh, go anywhere. So that's another thing that you can basically uh, get this HVV by, even if you're asymptomatic or subclinical, Subclinical patients mean the patient is showing some kind of symptoms but not true real symptoms. You can't really diagnose it based upon clinical uh, examination. So there may be something going on and we may want to rely on some of the tests which are available. Uh, as far as infectivity after treatment of genital ward or cervical cell abnormality is still unknown. So this data in progress. They want to relate that many times people get treated, they don't come back to report. So these are some of the challenges that we have in terms of getting uh, good data on these kind of infections. Now, the risk factors for women, very important, and uh, if you remember, uh, there is a vaccine available, especially for teenage girls within an age group, because of the high incidence and high prevalence of uh, HPV in women and as well as cervical cancer. So that actually goes by the most important risk factor is age. Uh, the younger the woman, the chances are she will have better, more chances of getting HPV. That's, that's like a relationship. Uh, the next sexual behavior risk increases with increasing lifetime number of male sexual partners. So the more partners you have, the more chances the probability is higher that you will get HPV. And then again, uh, the other important thing is an early age of first sexual intercourse. For some reason, some of the studies say 
And remember, uh, I, I'll show you the data that I have for uh, risk, sexual risk behavior in uh, UST, that there is a very high incidence of having uh, sexual activity in teenage girls before the age 30. So that again is tied up with them having HPV infection and further leading to, to cancerous condition. Uh, sexual behavior of male sex partner, raising kids for women whose sex partners had multiple sex partners. There's another thing, uh, cross infectivity, that uh, obviously uh, if that kind of a promiscuous behavior is there, the chances will increase for you to have an STD. Uh, as far as immune status is concerned, HP more likely to be detected in immune suppressed women. That's like our detection, but remember, for most of the time, our immune system does clear this, this virus within two years. There are some of the studies that you think that our immune system normally takes care of that, but doesn't mean that it's not going to come again. So most of the uh, microbiologists believe that once you have it, you're going to live and die with it, as simple as that. It's going to be there. It depends upon the time and the right time that it's going to come and recur. Okay, uh, as far as this factors for men is concerned, again, greater lifetime number of sex partners, greater number of recent sex partners, and being uncircumcised, there's another, some of the risk factors are, that are being related to men having chances of getting HPV infections. Uh, pathogenesis, remember uh, we did talk about pathogenesis for general viral infections, pretty much the same, except some of the viruses may have some uh, pathogenic factors that obviously are related to the mucosa of genital tract, in this case human papilloma virus, and then also their ability to change the, the uh, metabolism of the cell leading to cancer cell and other, other lytic infections that you may have. Okay, so as far as virus is concerned, this is a double-stranded DNA virus and that of course belongs to a uh, Papova viridi family. This is a larger family that includes uh, a larger group of DNA viruses. I'll just pick up a couple of DNA viruses which are important. So you can see that it is a DNA virus. Uh, genital type has specific tropism for genital skin and mucosa. That's something special for this virus. But remember, uh, as the sexual trends and sexual behaviors are changing, many a time this virus would not limit itself to genital lien. It will also go to the mucosa, especially oral mucosa and, and, and pharynx as well. And so this is another thing that this virus has adapted over time, so the chances are that you may have an oral wart as well, or a pharyngeal wart as well, or a laryngeal wart as well. And many times, especially for papilloma of larynx, again, a very uh, could be a very uh, common precancerous condition. Uh, infection generally indicated by the detection of HPV DNA or capsid protein. That's what we normally do when we want to diagnose the presence of this virus. Now, if you go for, remember I said uh, cytopathogenesis, remember the term I used, cytopathogenesis, there's a typical kind of tissue that, that the virus has to go through, cytopathogenesis. And in this case you will see that uh, it affects stratified squamous epithelium and it obviously stimulates your cellular proliferation. So that's why you've got wart. And the wart kind of keeps on growing and growing and growing. And this is coming from the stratified uh, squamous epithelium that's obviously present in those areas that these viruses normally infect. Uh, affected cell displays a broad spectrum of changes. So remember when it goes over there, a typical history, if you remember, uh, I don't know whether I can go through, uh, must have gone through hyperplasia, metaplasia, and neoplasia. Remember that pathophysiology? You must have talked about how, because the cancer doesn't come all of a sudden, it actually goes through some steps. So there's something called dysplasia, and then it comes to metaplasia, 
and something called anaplasia. So all these cases we really have to keep in mind, but obviously I would not go in detail. Uh, I believe uh, they will take that in the DAS course when they teach you cancer. So these also are different stages uh, that the viral cytopathogenesis also goes through. So virus is going to have a display, a broad spectrum of changing from a benign hyperplasia. But benign hyperplasia is just a growth with no chances of it becoming malignant. So we can cut it out. But many times, you remember, people will come to you and ask you the treatment of what. So obviously, for obvious reasons, you know, uh, there are over-the-counter uh, applications available and there are many things available, but of course if a person does have a genital ward, that's something serious because that still needs management and that needs many different tests as well. Uh, and you can see from here, the spectrum is broad. It can go from a benign, I would say like a non-malignant, to invasive carcinoma. There's something called carcinoma in situ. And that's again the basic uh, precancerous condition that happens in cervical cancer. So that's a little pass here, and if they see any, any abnormality, they can figure it out and start a proper treatment in time. So HPV does have this ability to change the uh, kind of, you know, the, the events happening in cell proliferation. So it goes and becomes a part of that. Because obviously, it needs to utilize the machinery of the cell and ribosomes of the cell to grow. Okay, let's see about the natural history of HPV. Uh, the natural history obviously is that uh, infections are transient, asymptomatic, could be subclinical, and may not have any clinical consequence in a normal person. So you may have it without noticing it unless you have obviously go and test yourself for the antibodies. The incubation period is unclear because we don't really, we cannot possibly figure out as to when a person was infected and when he actually showed the disease because we have no gauge for that. The median duration for new cervical infection is about eight months, but varies with type. So once you have been diagnosed with HPV, chances are within eight months you may get another recurrence. That's uh, <coughs> The mechanism that our immune system develops basically is DNA clearance. So, our, as I said, within two years, most of the scientists believe that our immune system should take care of that and would not let, uh, have the development of this DNA. Because the DNA virus, you have to clear a DNA so that the virus is taken care of. So, that's a typical. Uh, clearance or effective immune mechanism, you want to clear that uh, virus from your system. Okay, another problem with uh, the natural history of HPV is that uh, persistent infection. Remember we, when we talked the other day, we said that it could be a latent infection, it could be a chronic infection, it could be a recurrent infection. This, this is very common for many viruses, but in this case, the infection is persistent. It keeps on coming again and again and again. And you must have noticed, those of you who do have, you know, these benign warts on any part of the body, you know, uh, it comes again and again, again and again. But that's as a persistence of these viruses, and that's a, good, uh, a characteristic of the HFP DNA. And especially this persistent, uh, this persistence of this HPV virus is basically an important factor that's going to lead to precancerous pre cervical or cervical cancer because this is a quality of this particular virus that is going to cause problems in the cervix and lead to cervical cancer. And uh, many a times, you can see from here, most women with persistent HPV infection, they are. Uh, they normally do not. In this case, there are two studies done. One study showed that many times if you have a persistent uh, HP infection, so your immune system is like a fight between the virus and your immune system, and your immune system tends to dominate on the virus. 
Right? So one study said the chances are that you may not get uh, a cervical cancer. But again, you know, the cancer studies that you must have seen that we have limited data to really uh, draw uh, a reasonable conclusion, especially in this case. Most of the authorities agree that the HPV does lead to cervical cancer. Okay, let's see some of the clinical manifestation in the sequelae. And one of the clinical manifestation I already told you, uh, I may have some of other slides as well. The commonest uh, presentation you can see from here is genital warts. That's the commonest presentation that, that uh, people notice, that most of the patients would notice. But obviously, you can do a pap smear, and you can see changes in your pap smear, and uh, then again, typically, as I said earlier as well, it doesn't really limit to genitalia. It can also go to oral cavity and cause recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. That's another very common thing, again, uh, seen in recent days. As far as uh, other common HP infection manif uh, manifestation are cervical cell abnormality. So cervical cell abnormality, again, you would only see in uh, females because if they do go through those pap smear tests, this is one of them. If they do see some changes, they will always obviously send for a test for HPV DNA because that's the kind of a relation that these two may have. All right. Then again, uh, as far as appearance is concerned, I don't want you to really go in detail, but I just want you to keep in mind that uh, it can be a cauliflower-like appearance, typical, that's again precancerous, we saw that in another lesion as well, this is called condylomata, in this case acuminata, but you don't really have to remember all these days, but it becomes like a flower-like pattern, and I have some figures to show to you why we call it cauliflower-like appearance. Sometimes it may be a smooth papule. Papule is like a slight discoloration. Uh, and you must have heard me say this, skin lesions are very difficult to diagnose, but they all look alike. So it's better that you seek an, uh, what do you call, uh, a dermatologist's opinion. It could be flat papule, macule slightly raised, or it could be keratotic warts. That's what a typical C, uh, we also see on hands, on the face, on the lips, is like a typical keratotic, you see a dead skin on the top, and very rough kind of typical wart, scaly kind of lesion called keratotic warts. It's called thick horny layer that can resemble most common warts. But again, there are a lot of differential diagnoses, so I don't want you to go in detail. I just concluded by telling you that usually this uh, dermatologist basically will decide, but if you do have a proper history taken and if it's associated with sexual transmissible diseases, the chances are that it is genital uh, warts, especially HPV. Uh, as far as location is concerned, uh, typically they say that in coital friction, is an area of the coital friction, and you may have a perianal warts, or you have an intraanal warts, or you may have intraneatus warts. So all those area, perineal area is exposed, and the virus can go and cause infection and cause irritations. And uh, many a times, again, patients with visible warts can be, may have multiple type of HPV type. That's another challenge that we have especially for treatment of HPV. And uh, remember, there are different types of serotypes. If you design a treatment for one, it's difficult to design a treatment for other. But you can see from here, that's why uh, it's a very common and important sexual transmissible disease. Okay. As far as symptoms are concerned, you can see they can present any symptom that actually because remember, when, whenever there is a disease in an area and the function of that particular organ is disturbed, so most of the symptoms are going to be accordingly. If you have an intraneatal, let's say, what, you will have dysuria. If you have uh, the common symptom that these people usually present with is itching. And uh, not that painful, 
But when we talk about herpes simplex, that's where the pain element comes. Because remember, pain usually initiates from the neuronal, neuronal element. So if there's a nerve involved, that's where the pain comes. But you can see a variety of symptoms depending upon where the, uh, the wards are, from dyspronia, pruritus, burning discomfort, and itching, and if it's in, uh, especially intra urethral, that's where the hematuria will come as well because it's very irritating. So once the urine is passed, it's going to irritate and even the blood will come out. Very, very painful condition that these patients go through. And you can see uh, most patients have uh, many, usually if there's a ward, it's not a one ward, there are multiple wards. That's another thing. And you can see uh, most patients have fewer than 10 with total area. There's quite a lot of area involved, especially in this area, and keeps on growing. And doesn't really uh, limit to that particular area, but it can go for any surrounding area uh, that actually may cause the symptoms. And many a times, people have really confused it with hemorrhoids as well. People think it's with hemorrhoids, and, the re and they may have a intra-anal uh, uh, wart, and that's causing the bleeding. So we have to be uh, very particular, especially when many times people come and they do self-diagnosis, I'm suffering from piles, hemorrhoids, and they start over the counter treatment without realizing that they are suffering from a papilloma virus. Okay, now, as the duration is concerned, uh, basically that depends upon the course of the viral disease. It could be, it can regress spontaneously, can persist. So it's, it's like an open-ended kind of progression of the virus where we, we don't really see any limitation. But the chances are that uh, it's usually, if it persists, so frequency and durations are unknown. And as a physician, what we do normally care about is recurrence. So even if you are properly treated, and remember, there is no good antiviral therapy as well. And also keep that in mind that uh, we have a challenge for antiviral therapy, and especially with this condition, it is really uh, very common for people to have recurrence after treatment. Okay, uh, high risk HPV. Remember, uh, we talked about HPV maybe on the lips or. Uh, on part of the skin as compared to genitalia, so we can also divide them into high risk patients. Typically, the high risk types are in the visible genital wards. These are the normal, typical high risk patients. And these usually are associated with uh, vulvar, penile, or anal squamous intraepithelial lesion. So you see a region outside. Uh, doesn't mean that this is only external, but you may see some of the internal lesions which are there. And many times you can see, especially, it can go from vulva all the way to the cervix. You can see the cervix is uh, affected. And cervix is about like 5 cm up on the uh, upper wall of the vagina. So you can see these viruses have tendencies to travel to those locations because of tropism and cause dysplasia of the, of the tissues. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if it does occur in pre-adolescent children, that might be a sign of sexual abuse or uh, vertical transmission. I also said it is possible, but uh, is uh, is rare. The only other concern that scientists usually are being asked, and the STD physicians are asked, uh, is there any fomite transmission? What is a fomite transmission? Yeah, linen clothes. So if you uh, use, especially in hospital conditions, or uh, so for my transmission is, but we don't know. They say possible, and of course I also believe it's possible once you have viral shedding. So if virus is being released in tears, in vaginal secretion, in semen, in sweat, the chances are that for my transmission can take place, but it's difficult for us to really document and prove. Perianal warts, so you can see a typical perianal warts over here. Again, this is a 
CDT copyrighted flights. Typical World War warts, and you see all this redness, and you can easily confuse that with fungal infection. It's not that easy for us to really diagnose. Uh, a typical area, the whole perineum is involved. Penile warts, you can see here, here a typical warts on the sides. And this is a typical case of intramenial wart, very rare but possible, uh, very painful, especially uh, in, uh, in men, obviously, intramenial uh, wart. And again, sorry, I didn't get, I didn't, where is located, intramenial, meatus, this is, meatus is the opening of urethra. This, this is what intramiatus means within the opening of the anterior end of urethra. Now, what we normally uh, care was especially in women because of the cervical cell abnormality. And uh, usually we do a pap test, we can do colposcopy to look at the whole uterus and all those adenexia, or we can do a biopsy as well. And many a time uh, it's present in those patients who are already under high risk HPV type. And uh, the, the problem in this case is many a times uh, many of these high risk HPV type do not cause any abnormality, so it goes unnoticed. That's another problem that you may have and it gets unnoticed. People don't see uh, show any signs of that. And uh, most women infected with high risk HPV types have normal pap tests. That's another problem that we have. So once we say something that comes in the textbook, this is because of that. So there's always a probability. So there's also the data. Yeah. Uh, Many times people who are in high risk, right, they don't show any pre-cancerous lesion. So they were high risk and they just end up with cancer. There's no intermediate pre-cancerous phase. Right? In other words, remember, let's see, by the time you detect cancer in cervix, it's too late. Right? There's nothing you can do, isn't it? But if you figure out carcinoma in situ, situ or pre cancer condition, you can actually remove the uterus. You can do something. So it's better to find out a pre cancer condition, a dysplasia, before going for metaplasia. Because once you have a cancerous condition, then you may have a secondary cells growth. Metastasis may also take place. Right? So in this case, what happens is once you have a high risk HPV types, Unfortunately, they show up with normal pap tests. The question you're going to ask, how are we going to know them? So there's only one answer is to keep on repeating pap spear. So they actually fall into those categories. If you were to advise pap spear like once a year, you may want to go for once every six months. So you increase the, uh, the uh, duration of testing for that. So they will predict the survival Yeah. Uh, <coughs> all right. And again, I did talk about recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. Again, very common condition, uh, especially in juvenile onset. You have laryngeal papillomatosis. So in the larynx, if you remember your anatomy of the voice box, that's where these tiny little uh, warts are there. Sometimes they remove it, to resect it. Uh, but again, it caused a lot of uh, difficulties in talking and breathing and so on and so forth. And that, again, they are all associated with different serotypes of HPV. Okay, uh, well, I'll just give you an idea. You don't really need to know that how do we really uh, diagnose it and how do we really treat it. It's a, it's a full flight, maybe a couple of like this what of material there. But just keep in mind that uh, the typical genital ward diagnosis made by visual inspection. 
So just look at it. But that's why I showed you and you see the side. If you happen to see that uh, kind of a wart, so that's by seeing it. Diagnosis by looking at those particular warts. Uh, then you can confirm diagnosis by, uh, especially if they are doing a biopsy. So biopsy can also be taken, uh, but many times uh, if you do take biopsy, then there are complications of biopsy as well. You do a punch biopsy, maybe a bleeding, recurrence, and many things. Especially imagine if you were to take biopsy from the intramural, because that's an, a very sensitive area. So if you punch, take, and then again there are a lot of problems over there. So the most chances are that we take a biopsy when the diagnosis is uncertain and when the patient is immunocompromised and then there are other reasons for us to look for uh, excluding any differential diagnosis. Uh, and remember that as far as differential diagnosis is concerned, whenever you have those flower-like, polyflower-like lesions, it doesn't really necessarily mean that it's an HPV. You should also consider Caponema pallidum as well. If you remember, in uh, syphilis, we did talk about that chondromite um, marker lesion typically for syphilis. So, and again, by STDs, we will also do that. There could be other type of uh, molluscum contagiosum, some of the skin condition, that actually is caused by a pox virus. Uh, pox virus may cause, and there are, also, in pox virus, if you remember the pox virus, because I show you, there's usually a depression in the center, and the sides are elevated as compared to this one, which is like a doom-shaped lesion, so it's like a typical lump. And then again, uh, you can have many different conditions of the skin, right? As I said, there are hundreds of them, you don't really want to go in detail. All I want you to do know is that there are other conditions that may give a similar kind of picture and it could be uh, normal anatomic variants as well. And many things are there if you were to do differentially diagnose genital wart. Uh, how do we diagnose cervical cell abnormality? Pap test is by all uh, means is a standard for us to really uh, do that. Uh, patient management for STDs is very important to remember because the patient in this case, she came because she thought that her partner is having a bump on, on, uh, uh, on his penis and that's where we all need started. So there's a management issue over here, especially if you have multiple sex partners. So patient management is important. Uh, for patients' point of view, many a time, uh, we want to remove the symptomatic wards and uh, the chances are, if, even if you were to leave it untreated, it may, they may regress over time. We don't really know the behavior of that, whether or without they can stay for X amount of time. There's no obvious data available to do that. Uh, the current available therapies may reduce but do not eradicate infectivity. That's another challenge that we have for infections. We can treat it, remove it, but as I said earlier, uh, the chances are that once you have it, it's going to stay with you. Uh, we don't have any data to really relate treatment with the future transmission, we are not sure that it's there or it's available or not. Uh, then again, <coughs> many a times, uh, the only thing that we care about and we want to make sure the patients also know is the relation between HPV and cervical cancer. That's, that's the most important thing and we have to counsel the patient, let the patient know and also, as a rule, once you have a patient work suffering from one STD, always investigate for other STDs as well. Because if the risk factors are the same, doesn't really uh, make you immune that you have one STD and that's enough for you uh, to give you immune immunity to save you from the other STDs. So you may have more than one STD at a given time. So you may have syphilis, you may have HIV, you, people, some of the patients do have multiple STDs at the same time. So you need to test for chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, and syphilis, especially a uh, skinny person if he has a newly diagnosed genital wart or as a matter of fact any genital lesion. Uh, obviously uh, you are not really uh, bound to know all these treatment regimens. 
But if you go even now on any pharmacy, you will see that there are quite a few uh, therapies available and many a time people are, people are not available. Uh, this is one of those conditions that uh, we normally do cryotherapies and kind of freeze the war. Or sometimes what we do is that we give intralesional uh, interferons. So sometimes we inject interferons into the lesion to really uh, relieve the, uh, the symptoms. But there are many options available depending upon your health care provider. And a uh, typical uh, scenario is that there's always a recurrence. I mean, two third of patients will see recurrence. But again, as I said earlier, uh, the data is a little bit flimsy on that. We're not really sure. Uh, transmission issues are important because that's what we need to know. People want to know. And how do we avoid transmission? Unfortunately, for most, most of the SCDs, theoretically, they will say, Abstinence will be the best or a long term solution since it's not possible. So, we may want to actually advise some of other uh, kind of behavioral uh, therapies for the pe people to limit their uh, kind of sexual practices or whatever they want to do. But uh, they should be aware of uh, the fact that if they have it, they are passing it to. This is to the silent partner as well, without him or her knowing. So these are some of the things that we really discuss with this patient uh, about the transmission issues. How do we reduce the risk? Pretty much the same as of other STDs. So as far as reduction of risk is concerned, so the answer is again you have to really advise a behavior change for, for the patient and develop, usually they talk about individualized risk reduction plans depending upon uh, age and whatnot. So you can see that uh, there are uh, concerns and there are issues with each one of the individual management protocol. But one thing as a pharmacist you should know that uh, sometimes we may think of some thing that may sound good to you or may sound logical to you, but for many times in order to prove, we have to have that back up with the data. For example, in this case you can see uh, the effect of condom and preventing HP infection is unknown. Right? So you may think in your mind, that, well, this is what I'm going to be pr uh, protected from such infection, but there's no data there that will tell you that it's not transmissible. Chances are it is. Okay, uh, reporting requirements, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, whichever, is not a reportable infection in any state. It is not. Uh, some of the states will uh, obviously want you to report genital warts, and you have to check with your state and local health departments if you happen to work in those respective areas where there is. I don't know about Illinois, though. I can check it out. Uh, there, are, there is vaccine available, Gardasil, you must have heard of that, very common uh, and it's been advised, there are pros and cons, I don't want to go in detail, let people in your second year take care of that, but uh, many a time there is a vaccine available and the CDC is strongly advising, especially the age group from 9 to 49, to really go for that, or young, younger women really have to go before they begin the sexual activity. Once you begin the sexual activity, to be honest, there's no point taking this vaccine. That's what they say. Because you may have already picked up one of these types of uh, virus anyway. So what's the point? So case study, I'll just post it up on the uh, live text and it's a good exercise for you to really go through that and uh, know what the problems are and how to really rectify that. Any questions? Yeah, let me answer your question. I think you had a question from me. No, it was, I said in the beginning when you were 
It's not even advice for the boy. It's only for the teenage girl. But I can check it out. <laughs> yes. You know, people talk about all different types of diseases that people may get once you give them vaccine. So there is a, there are conspiracy theories as well. There are people who oppose vaccine anyway. And there are people like, there are companies with no more. There's a lot of money involved. Right? But uh, I don't want to go into that discussion, but this is a discussion. They're available. As I just told you, what's the point of taking a vaccine? For example, the CDC runs that like 50% of the girls in high school have had sexual experiences uh, before the age 10, for example. And they mandate that after 10. So what's the point? So there are many issues when it comes to statistics, and there are obviously a uh, lot of data. I think stats are going to be better to answer the question of these kind of uh, issues that you may have. But doesn't the vaccine only protect against certain That's also correct? Yeah, that's also correct. So like, why would it not be necessary? Or why would it be like relevant to not take it? So, so remember, the pros are to tell somebody that you know you have 80 or 90 percent of chances of getting HPV by the age 50, and uh, the only choice you have, and you're still going to do all, you have, you're going to be involved in all that risk behavior for sexual activity, so you have to take your chances on that. <coughs> I mean, it's, it's, by the end of the day, the patient has to decide. But I think you're right. It may not be available for all these different types of uh, uh, types, serotypes of the viruses. But the chances are that it can still give you some kind of immunity because there's always a shared kind of, you know, uh, homology or shared kind of antigen from one to another. And since it hasn't been started, so we don't know the data. So they really have to start doing it in a population group and then collect the data and then come up with some of the, some of the answers. Any, any other questions? All right, thank you.